So this is the longest video I've made by quite a big margin. I considered splitting it off into more parts at first, but ultimately I felt very strongly that putting the Call of Duty games side by side in a big video added a lot of value. By no means is it necessary to watch it all in one go though, so I've put timestamps in the description. Other than that, grab some popcorn and I hope you enjoy. There's not a single video game franchise I've put more time into than Call of Duty. The entire reason I got a PlayStation in the first place was to play the Call of Duty games. This was a time when basically everyone I knew was playing COD, and when I got my first game I absolutely no-lifed the multiplayer and got to max prestige in a very short time. Multiplayer was usually the focus of these games for me, but I always took an interest in the trophy lists as well. For over a decade now, I've been chasing the goal of obtaining every platinum trophy in the Call of Duty franchise, which is a trophy you earn for completing every other trophy in the game. This goal has proven to be quite the undertaking though, as the franchise is known for having some seriously challenging trophy lists. Call of Duty games usually consist of three main facets, campaign, multiplayer and a third cooperative game mode, and it should be noted that the multiplayer facet is often either omitted from the trophy list or featured only lightly. This means that campaign and the third game mode usually zombies or spec ops, are mostly the focus of these lists, which in a way attracted me to hunting the trophies. I was already hooked into the multiplayer, but now I had an engaging way of playing the other modes as well. In this video, I'll be telling my journey of earning the Platinum Trophy for every Call of Duty game of the PS3 generation. In contrast to my Far Cry video, I will be covering the base trophy list of each game only, so no DLC trophies. I might cover those in a later video. Also, I will discuss each Call of Duty game in the order they released, so not the order in which I completed the trophy list, which is why the quality of some recordings will vary a bit. Even so, it's hard to make a sensible chronological list of these games, but I'll get back to that point later in the video. Lastly, and most importantly, there will be major spoilers for every Call of Duty up until Advanced Warfare. The first Call of Duty released in 2003, before the PS3 and before Platinum Trophies even existed. It was a PC exclusive originally, but a port was released in the late 2000s for both the PS3 and the Xbox 360. This game was made in an era where the first person shooter genre was almost entirely made up of World War II shooters, in which the player would take control of an allied and usually American soldier. Call of Duty very much joined the World War II trend, but made itself distinct by focusing on British and Soviet operations in addition to the American campaign. The game starts off from the American perspective and follows a very familiar storyline, the Allied invasion of Normandy. The missions here are simple, you liberate Nazi-occupied villages along the coast of France. The British campaign gets more interesting. On multiple occasions you have to infiltrate enemy territory either on your own or with one other NPC and, in a James Bond kind of fashion, have to complete objectives like blowing up a dam or stealing intel from a battleship. This more cinematic, one-man army style type of mission is used more and more as the Call of Duty series progresses, so the soul of the later games is felt very strongly here. Perhaps coincidentally, it is also here that the older Captain Price joins you on a few missions. The game ends with the Soviet campaign, which is similar to the American. There are no sophisticated operations here, just grand assaults where you brute force yourself through enemy bases and claim your victory over the Nazis. Now, if I'm honest, the reason I bought this game wasn't to experience the World War II storyline, because at the time the sport was released, this simply wasn't very novel in gaming. The reason instead is that this game has a reputation among Call of Duty fans for being one of the most brutal campaigns to complete on Veteran, the highest difficulty in Call of Duty. The main reason for this is simple to pinpoint. There is no automatic health regeneration in the first Call of Duty. The player instead has to find health packs. On Veteran, however, there are no health packs, and you only regain health after completing a mission, meaning that you can only take 2-3 hits throughout every mission. On top of that, the controls in this game are extremely clunky due to its age, while the AI has godlike accuracy. As you'd expect to earn the Platinum Trophy for this game, you have to complete the entire thing on Veteran for the War Hero Trophy. There are actually two more difficulty-related trophies, for Regular and Hardened, that require separate playthroughs, since they don't stack. I first completed the game on regular and then went to veteran, so that I went into that difficulty with some experience. 
Playing the first Call of Duty on Veteran was an interesting experience, to say the least. I got through the American campaign practically unscathed. The missions were short and I was always accompanied by a large squad of soldiers. Of course I still died a ton, but it never took too much trial and error to make it to the next checkpoint. The British campaign then started, and it was honestly as if I had unlocked a fifth difficulty. It starts off very tough, with a lengthy defense section in the Pegasus mission, but it is the third mission, Eater Dam, where the difficulty spikes immensely. The guide considers this to be the hardest mission in the game, and it's not hard to see why. You're dropped off on top of this dam, completely by yourself, and have to make it all the way down to destroy a few flag guns, while also planting explosives throughout the dam along the way. There's enemies around every corner and at every vantage point, so you're forced to memorize enemy spawns and work out some kind of plan. The dam is the first real test of perseverance in the franchise, and I felt a great sense of pride when I finally made it to the bottom. This pride was very short-lived though, when I realized I had to fight my way back through the entire dam. Of course I had no other option than to just do the whole thing again in reverse. And, hours after starting the mission, I made it to the actual end. I was hoping for the next missions to be more forgiving to balance things out, but this was far from the case. Right after the dam you have this grueling, two mission long car escape section, where you are a sitting duck getting shot at from all directions. This is immediately followed by another insanely difficult mission, Battleship Turpits, which I personally found to be even harder than either dam. There's one checkpoint in particular, where you need to traverse an open part of the ship that's guarded by enemies in basically every direction. Anytime you take out a group of enemies, they somehow occupy the vantage points instantly again. This mission took me forever to complete, but at least the British campaign was over now. That leaves just the Soviet missions. Right off the bat, the tone is set. You spawn in without even a gun. This lasts for about a mission until things settle down again, and it's back to fighting your way through the ruined cities. The difficulty of the Soviet campaign is higher than the American, but generally lower than the British. Generally. There is one major exception to this, and that exception is Pavlov's house. One of the most infamous Call of Duty missions of all time, you have to clear this giant house of enemies without any checkpoints. When this is done, there's a brief section where you have to take out some tanks, after which you have to survive a 4 minute long defense section, this time with only a single checkpoint. You might think that you can pick a good spot and camp for the duration, but it doesn't matter where you go, you will either get swarmed by enemies, or sniped by one of the tanks. I don't want to know how many hours I spent on this mission, but it's the only time I ever took a celebratory picture upon completing a mission. I imagine many people had similar feelings upon beating Pavlov's house, because at this point the worst part of the storm is over. Some remaining missions were tricky, but nowhere near as difficult as any of the earlier missions. Storming the Reichstag in the final mission of the veteran playthrough, with the triumphant orchestration playing in the background, was the most rewarding and most memorable moment of my time with this game. It was finally over. In my eyes, this is what a veteran playthrough should look like. They nailed the difficulty in this game, because while veteran is extremely difficult to get through, it is ultimately surmountable with practice, patience and perseverance. I struggled and was even frustrated throughout a large part of my playthrough, but the sense of accomplishment I felt at the end made it all worth it. One last thing I wanted to mention and that I really liked were the quotes that were displayed every time you die, which have now become a staple of the franchise. These quotes range from eloquent to blunt, but were always genuinely thought-provoking. This made dying in this game somewhat less frustrating to me. With the veteran run completed, it was time to mop up the remaining trophies. These trophies were actually pretty cool challenges, like having to complete a mission melee only or pistol only, or having to complete a mission without taking damage. These can all be done on Greenhorn difficulty, so none of these were too much of a hassle. After this, only one trophy remains, completing the game on Hardened, which is the second highest difficulty in the game. Since I was used to Veteran, this was pretty much a cakewalk. Really the only challenge was that this was the third time I had to play through this game, and I was kind of done with it. A year after starting my first playthrough, I made it to the end of the game for the third and final time to earn the Call of Duty 1 Platinum Trophy. Mother, a few days ago we waved the flag of the motherland over the top of the Reichstag in Berlin. The war, at last, seems to be coming to an end.
With the first Call of Duty completed, for the only time in this series, we need to skip a few games. Call of Duty 2 was never released on the PS3, and Call of Duty 3 was released before trophies were a thing, so I won't cover these games in this video. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare was also released before the trophy update, but since this is inarguably the most impactful game in the entire franchise, I need to dedicate some time to this game as well. First of all, the multiplayer had received more polish than ever before, and as a result it was no longer primarily a single player experience. The multiplayer was now just as much of a selling point. Secondly, before COD 4 released, if you include spin-off titles, there had been 9 major Call of Duty releases, all of which were set in the Second World War, so for a large part of the existing player base, fatigue was starting to set in. Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare then released and single-handedly fixed everything. COD 4 takes place in the present day and focuses on the threat and implications of modern warfare. In this story, a Russian ultranationalist group takes the world in its clutches by seizing power throughout the Middle East and arming themselves with nuclear weaponry. In the campaign, you play both as part of an American and a British special force unit to stop a full-blown nuclear war from erupting. Many household names of the Call of Duty franchise are introduced here, like Captain Price, Soap, and the villain, Imran Zakayev. Two story beats are important for this video. Halfway through, Zakayev drops a nuke during an operation in the Middle East, killing tens of thousands of American soldiers. Second is that in the end, while you are able to kill Zakayev and stop him from starting a war, the conflict is far from over and new figures will rise up to follow in Zakayev's footsteps, as we will see in later games. The last thing I want to mention about this game is what is in my eyes the key to the major success of the Call of Duty franchise, which is the improved movement. This improvement is hard to put into words, but I think if you play any of the first games on console, you will feel the difference immediately. The controls of the older Call of Duties felt stiff and restrictive, making it much harder to be fully accurate. Call of Duty 4 and the subsequent games have incredibly smooth and natural movement, and as a result, gameplay becomes satisfying and addicting. I believe that this is the single most important element to Call of Duty's success. In summary, Call of Duty 4 launched the series into a new era on basically every front, and was a smash hit by practically every metric. Obviously, the next game in the series would capitalize on this success, and center around a more modern storyline as well, right? Yeah, that's not actually what happened. The next mainline Call of Duty would take place in the World War II setting again. The reason that this happened is actually quite easy to understand. While a new Call of Duty is released every year, it's not made by the same studio every year. In this era, Infinity Ward and Treyarch would alternate between making Call of Duties every year. Infinity Ward developed the first two, and also Call of Duty 4, and then Treyarch made Call of Duty 3. It was Treyarch's turn to make the new Call of Duty now, and since development started before Call of Duty 4, they played it safe and stuck to the World War II setting. This raised a lot of questions. Would the next Call of Duty merely be a return to an overused formula, or would it prove to be something more, a unique experience that would be remembered for years to come? Those questions were answered when the fifth game in the series released in November of 2008. Call of Duty World at War. While three of the four mainline Call of Duty games featured the World War II setting, all those three games did make an effort to differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack. The first Call of Duty featured three separate campaigns. Call of Duty 2 largely took place on the African front, and Call of Duty 3 featured both stories from Polish and Canadian squads. Call of Duty World at War creates its own identity, both by taking place on the Pacific front, and by giving a far more gritty and disturbing look at the Second World War. Limbs fly off on a regular basis, soldiers get tortured, and executions are merely insignificant background events. The first few missions of the single player are very standard. As part of an American platoon, you launch an assault against the Japanese on two islands in the Pacific. Funnily enough, the most noteworthy element of these missions is not the story, nor the setting, nor the gameplay. In the third mission, Hard Landing, you pass through an oddly familiar bunker. Anyone who's played a Call of Duty game before will instantly recognize this bunker, since this is of course Nacht der Untoten, the first Call of Duty Zombies map. I will elaborate more on this zombie game mode later in the video, but I just wanted to mention how surreal I find it to be that this completely insignificant bunker, that was clearly made as a simple mission asset with no further intentions, became a major symbol for the Zombies game mode, and has made it into every subsequent Treyarch Call of Duty game, aside from Black Ops 4. 
Like previous Call of Duty games, the story is told through multiple perspectives. In addition to the American perspective, this game has a Soviet story as well, which starts on the fourth mission, Vendetta. The mission Vendetta has gone down as one of the most gripping Call of Duty missions of all time. It starts off in Stalingrad, in a fountain filled with corpses. The Germans had intended to wipe this place clean, but mistakenly took all the bodies for dead. Two people in fact survived, the player and a certain Viktor Reznov. The player then accompanies Reznov through the ruined city, aiding him in tracking down and killing a German general. From beginning to end, this mission is a masterpiece in atmosphere and storytelling. Reznov's poetic lines resonate very strongly and are made all the more powerful by the expert voice acting from Gary Oldman. For days, I have crept through shadows like a rat. Now this place once echoed with conversations of friends and lovers. No longer. Mark my words, comrade. One day things will change. The mission ends with the player successfully eliminating General Ansel and escaping with Reznov by jumping into a freezing river. Reznov's character is so incredibly captivating that he has become a household name in the Call of Duty franchise, and in large part it is because of this mission. In the next mission, years after Vendetta, the player is reunited with Reznov and joins him in the fight against the Nazis on the Eastern Front. Both storylines progress in a predictable way from here on out. The Americans continue on the Pacific Front and end up destroying the Japanese resistance throughout. The game ends, just like the first Call of Duty, with a Soviet assault on the Reichstag. After making it all the way up top, right before planting the flag, you get ambushed by a German soldier making a last stand. Reznov then intervenes and victory is achieved. You always survive. Should be you. As long as you live, the heart of this army can never be broken. Things will change, my friend. As heroes, we will return to Russia's embrace. Finishing this mission does not send you back to the main menu though, but rather to a secret zombie game mode. Here you have to fight off zombies and survive for as many rounds as you can. In order to achieve this goal, some doors can be opened and weapons can be bought off the walls and from a mystical weapon box. This game mode was initially added as a simple experiment, but has now turned into one of the franchise's most beloved assets. As everyone knows, the map in question is Nachter Untoten, which is the bunker I mentioned earlier. Of course, given the simplicity of the map, the gameplay gets old fairly quickly, but the atmosphere of the map is something that will always stay with me. The unsettling noises and the zombies emerging from the fog in the distance are not at all dissimilar from a horror game. This new zombie game mode ended up being a huge hit and started an entire Call of Duty zombie saga. Even today, zombies is a massive part of most Call of Duty games, even the ones that aren't made by Treyarch. All of this started with Nachter Untoten. Sadly, since nobody in the development team thought this game mode had any legs, it isn't featured at all in the trophy list. So what does the trophy list in this game look like? Interestingly, since this game released right after the PlayStation Trophy update and before the Call of Duty 1 port, this is actually the first Call of Duty game to receive a trophy list and a platinum trophy. First of all, this trophy list has something that I really appreciate, a sense of humor. For example, there is a trophy that requires you to save a specific soldier from burning to death, so you're saving Private Ryan. There's also a trophy called Purple Heart that you earn by dying 20 times in a single mission. This is where the jokes pretty much end though, and the rest of the trophy list is brutal. As was the case with the first Call of Duty, you need to complete the entire campaign on veteran difficulty. World at War is perhaps the most infamous Call of Duty to beat on veteran. The challenge here is twofold. First, in several missions, the enemies respawn infinitely until you push up enough or complete an objective. This means that it never suffices to sit back and safely pick enemies off. You always need to advance and take huge risks to make any meaningful progress. 
Second, grenades. Endless grenades. On veteran, the enemies seem to have an infinite supply of them, and on many occasions you'll get five at a time thrown in your direction. At least though, as opposed to the first Call of Duty, there is health regeneration. The start of the campaign is somewhat tough, but still relatively doable. The first difficult section takes place in the fourth mission, where you have to battle a German sniper, who is probably the most accurate enemy in the entire Call of Duty franchise. You have to get three hits off on him, while you die in one shot. The only way to get past this guy is to be extremely alert and shoot him the moment he shows himself. Though, of course, you never know where he is, and he often puts up decoys to mess with you. Overall, a tricky section that I really like. After Vendetta, the difficulty starts to pick up significantly. Burn him out is the first truly tough mission, which has an insanely hard ending where you need to emerge from a bunker to take out an enemy position. Since a mission takes place in trenches, there is only a very slim path to push up through, so you're basically stuck in a meat grinder. The next mission, fittingly called Relentless, is even more difficult, where the problem is a section where you have to assail a bunker. It is the first part of the game where you really notice the infinitely spawning enemies, and since you also get grenades spammed into oblivion, this is regarded as one of the most difficult missions in the game. It is also the first mission that took me well over an hour to complete. After Relentless, you actually get a small break, with a tank mission, two short Soviet missions, and then a fighter plane mission, all four of which are fairly easy to get through. This is the calm before the storm though, because after the mission Black Cats, hell ensues. Blowtorch and Corkscrew is next, and is undoubtedly the hardest mission in the American campaign. The bad weather, in addition to the abundance of smoke screens, make it extremely difficult to spot enemies, so for this entire mission you will get killed and have absolutely no idea where the enemy even was. The mission mainly revolves around clearing bunkers, the last of which is pretty much an unassailable fort. Once inside this fort, things don't exactly get easier, as it's of course filled to the brim with enemies. Beating this mission felt like an immense accomplishment. The following mission, Breaking Point, is the conclusion to the American campaign, and is luckily not as hard as Blowtorch and Corkscrew. The mission after, however, is widely regarded as one of the most difficult Call of Duty missions of all time. Heart of the Reich is the penultimate mission in the game, in which you have to storm the Reichstag. You have to take out four flag guns along the way, which are all heavily defended by the German army. Once again, the enemies respawn infinitely, so anytime you take out a decent amount of enemies, they're back at their posts within a few seconds, making it extremely hard to book any progression. Also, unsurprisingly, this is perhaps where the grenade barrage reaches its peak. There's really no consistent way to get past this section. Making it through is a matter of brute force and a bit of luck. This mission took me several hours to beat. Reaching the end meant that the worst was over though, since the last mission is easy in comparison and didn't take me very long to complete. After a grueling few days, I finally beat the game on veteran difficulty. To earn the Platinum now, I only needed to earn the remaining campaign challenge trophies. Most of these trophies are too easy to warrant any coverage, but some of them pose a really fun challenge. For Gunslinger for example, you have to take out General Amsel with a pistol shot at the end of Vendetta. This section is supposed to be done with a sniper rifle, so using a pistol at this range is a massive handicap. It's really hard to locate the general without a scope, let alone get any hits off on him. The saving grace is that Reznov alerts you whenever he's moving, giving you a decent indication on when to shoot. I got this done in the end without too much trouble. There is one trophy though that did pose a serious challenge. The Sum of All Zeroes trophy requires you to take down 45 of the 57 fighter planes in the Black Cats mission. It sounds like you have a decent margin of error, but these planes fly by in an instant and thus are easily missed. This is the only miscellaneous trophy that took me some grinding to get. With this done, it was smooth sailing for the rest of the trophy list. In many ways, World at War is sort of the forgotten child of this Call of Duty era. It was a World War II game, released at a time where the interest for the genre was clearly elsewhere, and its legacy isn't as great as its contemporaries. Despite all this, to anyone who has played this game, it is incontrovertibly clear that World at War has more than justified its existence. The cold and gritty examination of the Second World War is a direction the franchise hadn't explored yet, and of the World War II Call of Duty saga, this game has left the longest lasting impressions on the player base. 
The excellent storytelling and characters, in particular Viktor Reznov, made this campaign a truly memorable one. Not to mention the invention of Call of Duty Zombies, that has started a saga spanning numerous games over the course of the past 14 years. For Call of Duty 1, earning the Platinum Trophy took nearly a year, but for World at War, it merely took a month, simply because I was so engrossed. The very last trophy I needed was Mortardom, for which you simply need to get a few mortar kills. After overcoming the beast that is this game, I could claim my prize now. The next Call of Duty to release was Modern Warfare 2, the highly anticipated successor to Modern Warfare. This game marked the start of a new era, in which Call of Duty wasn't just a popular shooter anymore, it was a global cultural phenomenon. On the release night in 2009, the lines at GameStop stretched out far beyond the store's entrance. The day after, people were skipping school or took a day off work, and on all consoles combined, over a million people were simultaneously online playing the multiplayer. All of this goes to show that during this time, Call of Duty was a massive part in the lives of many young people. As its name suggests, it follows in the footsteps of the 2007 game Modern Warfare, in depicting modern conflict with entirely new technology and weaponry. Like its predecessor, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 was absolutely groundbreaking. The game got a complete graphical overhaul and had a much more vibrant color palette than Call of Duty 4. In addition, truly modern equipment was now available for use, like a heartbeat sensor and thermal sights. On release, this was the absolute peak of realism in video games, and paired with the fact that it was simply an incredibly fun game to play, made Modern Warfare 2 one of the greatest games of that era. The campaign of Modern Warfare 2 is set in 2016, five years after the events of the original Modern Warfare. To give a quick recap of the first game, the Western world is in conflict with a powerful Russian ultranationalist group threatening global nuclear warfare. In that game, a special operations force took down the leader of that ultranationalist group, Imran Sakayev. As it becomes clear in the second installment, however, eliminating Sakayev has done nothing but fan the flame, because one of his lieutenants has now taken his spot and is arguably an even bigger threat. This person is Vladimir Makarov. Like previous Call of Duty games, it follows multiple perspectives. You start the game off as Private Joseph Allen, and in the first two missions you have to invade a Middle Eastern city to rescue a stranded unit. During this operation, your actions greatly impress your superior, General Shepard, who then takes you under his wing and has you infiltrate Makarov's circle, with the idea of you functioning as a spy to take down Makarov's organization from the inside. After all, we've already learned that simply eliminating the leader only makes matters worse. In the third mission, Cliffhanger, the second storyline kicks off. You have to sneak into a highly guarded enemy base to recover sensitive information from a satellite. First of all, when I first saw this mission, I could not believe a video game could look this realistic. Even today, on a simple PS3, this game holds up very well graphically. Second, in this storyline, you play under the command of Captain Soap, the protagonist of the original Modern Warfare. I love the sense of continuity this brought to the story, and it was cool to see him function as a captain now. The operation doesn't go as planned, however, and you end up escaping in this really cool snowmobile chase sequence. Cliffhanger is easily one of my favorite missions from the game. It starts off as an engrossing stealth operation and ends with an intense action sequence. Some of the greatest qualities a Call of Duty has to offer, all in one mission. The mission that follows Cliffhanger is widely regarded to be the most controversial and most shocking Call of Duty mission of all time. In our first confrontation with Vladimir Makarov, we assume the role of Private Allen again, who, under an alias, works for Makarov. In order to gain Makarov's trust, you have to join him in one of his operations in a Moscow airport. Right before this, he says those famous words.
by the imperative no Russian. Makarov forbids you from speaking Russian, because Makarov wants the world to think that the shooting was an act of terrorism from the US against Russia, which of course will garner support and sympathy for his cause. Makarov knows that Alan is a spy though and kills you at the end of this mission. And since you are in fact an American soldier, this means that Makarov's plan of creating a false flag operation was completely successful. There have been countless debates on whether the content of this mission is too disturbing. For me personally, the line between a fictional video game and real life has always been very clear, so I can't say I ever had a problem with this mission. It also successfully serves a purpose, as it makes the player intimidated by Makarov, though I could see how other people think it goes too far. In any case, there is an option to skip the mission, should you object to playing it. The first act ends with the mission takedown, where we first meet the iconic character Ghost. Then, as a result of the airport massacre, Russia invades the US and thereby starts World War III. This meant that the game wouldn't take place in remote and abandoned locations anymore, like in the first game. The battle was now fought on US soil in very familiar suburbs, which contributed to the intimate and more disturbing look of modern conflict that this game brought. The second and third act of the game revolve around both defending the American capital and taking part in special operations in Russian territory, under the command of General Shepard. While Shepard is your superior for most of the game, halfway through you conduct a rescue operation to save Captain Price from a Russian gulag, after which he joins the task force as well. According to Intel, Price is the man Makarov despises most of all. The reason why this is becomes very clear, as Price, among other things, launches a literal nuke and detonates it above the US to take out the Russian air support. Nearing the end, a huge operation is started by General Shepard, who sends the task force to two hideouts where Makarov might be located. Roach and Ghost are sent to a safe house in Russia, while Price and Soap are sent to a boneyard in Afghanistan. At the safe house, Makarov is nowhere to be found, but they are able to recover valuable intel. Roach and Ghost make it back to Shepard, who, in one of the most shocking betrayals in video game history, shoots both of them. We learn that Shepard became disillusioned after losing 30,000 of his men to the nuke from the first game, and that he had felt that the American public didn't appreciate the scope of this loss. Now that World War III has broken out, Shepard wants his personal squad to kill Makarov so that he can take the credit and redeem himself as an honorable military commander. Shepard sends Soap and Price to a different location and also plans to have them killed, but Price became aware of his true plans and, in one of my favorite moments in the entire franchise, asks Makarov for help on taking down Shepard. Soap and Price then start the hunt for Shepard. Shepard ends up getting the jump on them though, and stabs Soap, which he follows up by beating up Captain Price. In true Call of Duty fashion, a dying Soap pulls the knife out of his torso and skewers Shepard in his eye, instantly killing him. Makarov is still alive though, but since the world doesn't know of Shepard's betrayal, Soap and Price are now fugitives, setting up the story for the third installment. 
The single player of this game delivers on every front. It has a captivating story, spectacular action scenes, jaw-dropping betrayals, and even a fantastic soundtrack. In my eyes, this is one of the best Call of Duty campaigns. The trophy list, or at least the part that pertains to the campaign, was a bit of a letdown though. As always, it requires you to complete the game on veteran difficulty, but at no point in my veteran playthrough did I feel like I couldn't make progress. A lack of challenge to me always makes for a boring and forgettable experience. I was hoping for some hard single player challenges at least, like some of all zeros from World at War, but again, nothing struck me as genuinely difficult. Probably the most challenging trophy is Pit Boss, requiring you to beat the training pit within 30 seconds, but this time is still very lenient. The difficulty of the trophy list clearly doesn't lie with the campaign, but that doesn't mean there isn't any difficulty. While multiplayer is omitted from the trophy list, the new third game mode, Spec Ops, is featured heavily, and all of the rarest trophies are related to it. Spec Ops is basically a set of bite-sized campaign missions, focusing more on creating an interesting challenge rather than serving a narrative. For example, the missions have you destroy a certain amount of vehicles on a bridge, survive against waves of enemies, or complete a snowmobile time trial. The Spec Ops mode also introduces an infamous enemy in the Call of Duty franchise, the Juggernaut, a deadly panzer soldier who is extremely dangerous on veteran difficulty. The missions are divided into five sets, Alpha through Echo, and increase in difficulty. As you might guess, to earn the Platinum Trophy, you need to complete all of these missions on veteran difficulty, and the trophy tied to this feat is the rarest in the game. As I said before, the campaign on Veteran was disappointingly easy, but luckily with Spec Ops, this is far from the case. This is for a simple reason, you don't get checkpoints during Spec Ops missions. This simple design choice increases the enjoyability of the missions tenfold. You can't just brute force yourself through the missions anymore, but you actually need a decent strategy to complete them. This also makes the endings far more nerve-wracking, because if you die, you lose a lot of progress. Now, while most of these missions can be done solo, you are robbing yourself of an amazing experience if you do so. Every Spec Ops mission can be done co-op, both offline and online, which is some of the most fun you can have on a Call of Duty game. Some of my fondest Call of Duty related memories are tied to attempting to complete veteran Spec Ops over the course of a summer with a friend. On most missions, co-op makes things more interesting for the simple fact that a degree of teamwork is now required to get through them. But in some instances, this is inverted and you're pitted against each other. For example, the snowmobile time trial becomes a race of who can get the fastest time, resulting in some great competition. My favorite mission from the first four tiers is easily hidden. This mission is basically a giant sniper battle, where you have to find and eliminate enemy snipers who are incredibly well hidden in the terrain. It's very suspenseful, and if you're playing for the first time, it's actually very difficult to spot all the snipers. There are also a few co-op exclusive missions, where one player is set on foot, while the other provides cover fire with either a helicopter or an AC-130. Once again, requiring teamwork. While the first four tiers certainly provide a decent challenge, it is the fifth tier that makes the Spec Ops trophy notorious. It starts with wet work, a mission that has you rescue hostages on an oil rig while being assaulted from every direction throughout. There are enemies shooting you through smoke with thermal sights, helicopters everywhere, and in addition to all of that, if you hit a civilian during any of the breach sections, it's game over. Really, the only thing missing is juggernauts. Luckily, in the remaining two missions, you'll be fighting juggernauts exclusively. Armored Piercing is featured on that same oil rig, where 15 juggernauts are out to hunt you down. This mission ends up being kind of underwhelming though, because, I mean, the bird 50 cal. High Explosive is a totally different story though, since you need to take out 10 juggernauts using only explosives in a very small area. Right off the bat, it was very clear that staying in a single position wasn't a viable strategy, so I ended up running around and taking the juggernauts out from a distance. It was through this strategy that I was eventually able to wrap up the Spec Ops and earn my trophy. Completing the Spec Ops stars meant that I only had to complete a few miscellaneous campaign trophies to earn my coveted Platinum. Modern Warfare 2 is easily one of my favorite Call of Duty games of all time, but I have to say the trophy list was a little underwhelming. 
The campaign section was too easy, and sadly, multiplayer wasn't featured in the trophy list at all, despite it being the biggest reason for its success. At least Spec Ops was there to save the day, and mostly because of this game mode, I still greatly enjoyed going for the Platinum. The very last trophy I still had to earn was a trophy with some symbolic relevance. The Ghost Trophy requires you to infiltrate the facility and plant the C4 in Cliffhanger without alerting any enemies. Cliffhanger is probably my favorite mission from this game, so I thought it would be a fitting setting to complete the trophy list. You find it. No kills, no arrests. Impressive approach. I'm picking up more radio traffic about the satellite. Stand by. Got it. Sounds like the satellite's in the far hangar. Race you there. Oscar Mike. Hi. time and the world do not stand still. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. After Modern Warfare 2, it was Treyarch's turn to develop the 2010 Call of Duty game. It was later announced that this game would be called Call of Duty Black Ops. Up to this point, the Treyarch releases had not been nearly as successful as the games from Infinity Ward, but Black Ops brought an end to this. When it released in November, it shattered video game sales records, even surpassing Modern Warfare 2. The success of this game is still felt to this day, as every subsequent Treyarch game has carried the Black Ops namesake. It must be noted that, while this is the first game named Black Ops, it actually isn't the start of the quote-unquote Black Ops timeline, since the story is a continuation from Call of Duty World at War. Black Ops is no longer set in the Second World War though, but rather in a fictional version of the Cold War. The single-player story has a very interesting structure. You play as a CIA operative called Alex Mason, and for most of the game you're strapped in a chair and interrogated by two unknown people. This means that the story is told primarily through flashbacks. Alex Mason is also plagued by intrusive visions of numbers, which sets up one of the game's most important questions, what do the numbers mean? The first mission sees Mason attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro, and here we get introduced to another franchise icon, Frank Woods, who is the chair counterpart to Captain Price in a way. The assassination fails though, and Mason is imprisoned in a Russian gulag. Here, we reach what might very well be one of the best Call of Duty missions of all time, for Kuda. In the Russian Gulag, we are accompanied by a very familiar face, Viktor Reznov, who is leading a massive revolt to break out of the Gulag. Like Vendetta in World at War, this is a thriller of a mission from beginning to end. Reznov's motivational words and the excellent soundtrack do a perfect job of making you feel genuine adrenaline while escaping the prison. Though what is easily the most impactful element of the mission is the 8 steps to freedom that Raznov chants at the very start. In order, these steps are Secure the keys Ascend from darkness Rain fire Unleash the horde Skewer the winged beast Wield a fist of iron Raise hell And finally, freedom. These steps are not just significant because they actually play out in this order in the mission, but they have become instrumental for solving the easter eggs in the zombie maps, which we will cover later. After this mission, the stage for the story is set. War is looming between the US and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is in possession of a very dangerous biochemical weapon called Nova 6, and a man called Dragovich is working to unleash this weapon throughout the US. This man must be stopped at all costs. The game continues mostly with CIA operations to track down Dragovich and take down his handlers. During all of this, Mason is still battling intrusive visions, like aiming a gun at the president. Things come to a head in the mission Rebirth. The CIA is tasked with capturing Dr. Steiner. 
the inventor of Nova 6, but Mason goes on a rogue operation with Reznov, who kills Steiner instead. This means that the one man who knew of Dragovich's location is dead. This leads us to the second to last mission, Revelations. At this point, the story is told from present day again, so the mission starts with Mason strapped in the interrogation chair. The interrogators have become frustrated, because Mason isn't giving them the information they need, whatever that may be. This leads one of the interrogators to a last resort, revealing himself to be Hudson, a fellow CIA operative that accompanied Mason on many missions. Hudson then drops a number of bombshells. First of all, he reveals that Reznov died in the Verkuda escape, and that you are merely seeing visions of him throughout the game. Hudson then reveals that, while imprisoned in Russia, you became subject of Dragovich's MK Ultra like brainwashing, effectively turning you into a Soviet spy, programmed to carry out orders like taking out the president. Reznov sabotages programming at Verkuda though, ordering you to kill Dragovich, Kravchenko, and Steiner instead. The present situation in the US is dire, since Dragovich has many programmed sleeper agents posted throughout the US, threatening a catastrophic release of Nova 6 at any moment. The objective of the interrogation now becomes clear. Since Mason has been programmed at Dragovich's facility, there is a memory of the location of the number station somewhere deep inside of his mind. Mason now finally snaps out of his programming, and remembers enough information to pinpoint the location of the facility. Mason and Hudson head there immediately, and after a lengthy struggle, manage to take out Dragovich. The game then ends in a very ambiguous way. The US is saved from the Nova 6 threat, but the final montage shows Mason present at the parade where JFK would be assassinated, heavily implying that he still carried out his orders in taking him down. The platinum trophy for this game is the first platinum of the franchise that is marked ultra rare, meaning that less than 5% of trophy hunters have earned the trophy. Mind you, this isn't 5% of the entire PlayStation player base, but rather 5% of users on PSN profiles, who are generally more dedicated about completing trophy lists. First of all, like World at War, the campaign has some interesting challenges. As always, you need to complete the campaign on Veteran, but while this was harder than Modern Warfare 2, it still wasn't nearly as difficult as World at War. Throughout the campaign though, a few tough trophies have been laid out, like hitting every slingshot target without missing in Forkuda, or downing two helicopters with a single Valkyrie missile. The rarest of them all is Lightfoot, that requires you to speedrun the boat escape on Veteran difficulty, which I left until the very end. Like Modern Warfare 2, campaign isn't where the true difficulty of the trophy list lies however. For that, we need to take a look at Zombies. After the unexpected success of the World at War game mode, Zombies has made a return. This time launching with two maps on release, Kino der Toten and 5, and then a third map featuring third person gameplay, called Dead Ops Arcade. No other Zombies map makes me as nostalgic as Kino der Toten does. I didn't play World at War on release, so this was my introduction to the game mode. During the life cycle of World at War, many improvements to the game mode have been added, like perks, pack-a-punch, and also a main cast of characters. Nikolai, Dempsey, Richtofen, and Takeo. I put an absurd amount of hours into this map when it first launched. I was that annoying guy who would always turn on the secret song by interacting with all the meteorites. And I mean, can you blame me? I still get goosebumps at the drop in the final chorus. Kino was always one of the easier maps, so as a new Zombies player, it was perfect. The second map, 5, is unlocked upon completing the campaign. It takes place in the Pentagon, and the introductory cutscene is one of my favorites in all of Zombies. Do not pray for easy lives, my friends. Pray to be stronger men. 5 was usually skipped in favor of Kino, mainly because the map was a lot more difficult. What I appreciated about the maps though, were the strong elements of horror that were present throughout both. Samantha's room in Kino and the laps in 5 never failed to make me uneasy, and they added a lot of character to the maps. The zombie trophies are actually pretty hard to obtain. The Collector, for example, has you buy every single wall buy in a single game, which requires a ton of points and therefore a decent amount of playing time. 
In 5, there is a trophy for killing the Pentagon Thief, without him stealing your weapons. Now, this guy is practically invincible, but there is a trick to kill him pretty quickly, which is to down yourself and then bombard him with the upgraded pistols. Dead Ops Arcade really only has one trophy for you to earn, Easy Rhino, for which you need to knock over 20 enemies using a single speed boost, which is kind of tricky. The most difficult trophy in the game by far is called Sacrificial Lamb, requiring you to shoot another player with a pack punch crossbow and kill at least 6 zombies. This is the one trophy that is considered a big roadblock, since you need a cooperating teammate and also get the crossbow early enough so that it still one-shots the zombies. The random mystery box can be quite unforgiving, so you'll probably need to restart a few times. Luckily, I had a friend to help me out, and we ended up getting it after a few tries. After earning this trophy, I knew I had the platinum in my grasp. One last thing I want to mention is that there is finally a hint of multiplayer incorporated in the trophy list. Most of the multiplayer trophies can be earned in combat training, but for one trophy, you do need to play public matches. In the money has you play a few wager matches and finish in the top 3, a total of 5 times. Of course, if you're familiar with the multiplayer, this is easily done, but I was just happy to see the biggest element of the Call of Duty games finally featured in the trophy list. After earning Sacrificial Lamb, I did a cleanup run of the campaign, ending the journey with the veteran speedrun trophy I mentioned earlier. I actually ended up getting this on my first try, granting me my platinum over 5 years after starting this game. from falling into the hands of the British. Well, that's the 2011 Call of Duty release was Modern Warfare 3, the grand finale to the Modern Warfare series. Of the three Modern Warfare games, this installment is probably the least beloved, as it wasn't as groundbreaking as the previous two entries. The graphics hadn't been noticeably improved, and hardly any new features had been implemented. In many ways, this game is sort of just Modern Warfare 2.5. For me, it's probably my favorite game of all time. This basically exclusively has to do with the multiplayer though, and since the trophy list doesn't feature multiplayer, that's a story for a different time. Like Modern Warfare 2, this game featured a Spec Ops game mode in addition to the campaign and multiplayer, which this time consisted of not just smaller campaign missions, but also a survival mode. In this mode, you get attacked by enemies and have to survive for as many ways as you can, so it's sort of zombies, but with actual people. We'll get into that later. The single player starts off right after killing Shepard, meaning that Soap is still mortally wounded and that both him and Price are now fugitives. At the start, we get introduced to the last main protagonist of the Modern Warfare trilogy, Yuri, who aids Price in saving Soap's life. Meanwhile, Russia is still invading the US, something that Makarov is of course fueling. The drama and spectacle are right on par with that of the second game, as, among other things, chemical attacks are launched throughout Europe and at one point even the Eiffel Tower comes crashing down. The most dramatic mission of all comes near the end though. The squad has retrieved intel about a meeting that Makarov is attending in Prague. Price, Soap and Yuri infiltrate and take position in a nearby church, hoping to assassinate Makarov. Once again, Makarov is a step ahead and had rigged the building with explosives, which he detonates with the team inside. For Soap, the explosion is fatal. Before passing away, Soap reveals that Makarov knows Yuri, resulting in two of the most iconic Call of Duty scenes back to back. Through flashbacks, we learn that Yuri was an ultra-nationalist working together with Makarov. 
Makarov's actions became too extreme in Yuri's eyes, so he turned on Makarov, after which Makarov tried to kill him. Price is skeptical of Yuri's story, but doesn't have much of a choice to keep him on his team. Against Makarov's plan, the Russian president seeks to restore peace in the world, so Makarov takes him and his daughter captive. Near the end of the game, both of them are saved by American forces, which ultimately ends the conflict. Now, Makarov is the fugitive. In the final mission of the game, Yuri and Price storm one of Makarov's hideouts in Dubai, armed in juggernaut suits. It starts off well, but Makarov gets the jump on them both and ends up killing Yuri. Captain Price then avenges Yuri's death by killing Makarov in the most Call of Duty way possible. Trophy-wise, the single player suffers from similar issues to that of Modern Warfare 2, because there is simply a lack of real difficulty. I don't remember any mission that gave me issues on veteran difficulty, and the miscellaneous trophies can all be earned pretty easily. The rarest single player trophy is a trophy for collecting all the intel, which is literally a matter of looking up a YouTube guide and picking up all the laptops. The only somewhat tricky trophy is called Nine, for which you need to kill nine enemies with strafing runs in scorched earth. The strafing runs are very inconsistent, and there aren't many enemies to kill anyway, so this took me a handful of tries. Once again, the difficulty of the list lies with Spec Ops, which is now divided into Survival Mode and Special Ops missions. Like I said before, Survival Mode was a new addition, and, at the time, the Infinity Ward alternative to Treyarch's Zombies. While this mode has been mostly forgotten by the player base, I always thought it was pretty decent. As opposed to zombies, where you constantly have to strafe around and train zombies, in this mode it's a very viable strategy to camp in a building and hold the enemies off for as long as you can. Of course, as the rounds progress, attack helicopters and heavily armored juggernauts are thrown your way, so you're forced to move around the map too. For one trophy, you have to reach wave 15 on every map, and while I wish the wave requirement was a little higher, the maps actually increase in difficulty, so you can definitely mess this up on the later maps. Another trophy requires you to reach a balance of $50,000 in a game. Ideally, you spend all your money on armor and equipment, so reaching this total actually took a decent amount of time. Probably the last survival trophy most people earn is Arms Dealer, for which you need to buy everything from the armory. This might as well be called a trophy for reaching level 50, because you need to be max level to unlock everything in the first place, making this trophy a bit of a grind. Overall, I really enjoyed my time with this mode. Next were the Special Ops missions, which I thought were just as great as in Modern Warfare 2. Once again, the main challenge here was to beat every mission on veteran difficulty for the Overachiever trophy. The first tier of missions was actually quite challenging this time around, mainly because of the Mile High Jack mission that has to be completed within a pretty slim time frame. A mission I quite liked was Firewall, which is a two-player mission where one person takes control of a camera sentry to guide the other through waves of enemies. The player on the ground actually has to rely pretty heavily on the player in the turret, so this is one of those missions where teamwork and communication skills are fostered strongly. Mission 12, Server Crash, is widely regarded as the most difficult Spec Ops mission in Modern Warfare 3. It starts off with a hectic vehicle segment, where missing a single launcher shot will likely get you killed instantly. Afterwards, you infiltrate the server room and initiate a DSM defense section. This section takes a little over a minute, but you're basically a sitting duck inside this room, being bombarded by enemies from several directions. If you make it this far, you still have to escape, at which point the game throws a juggernaut your way. If you die at this point, you have to start over from the beginning, which happened more than a few times to me. After completing this mission, the worst was over. The last mission I struggled with was Smackdown, because it starts with this lengthy helicopter section, where you have no protection from being shot at by enemies. When you finally land, you still have to take out a number of drug stashes, which is easy to mess up. This was the final mission I had to complete for my trophy, and since Spec Ops was the last part of the game I tackled, this meant that this successful run earned me my Platinum Trophy. That's the way it's done.
Every Call of Duty game up to this point has featured either historic or modern conflict. The 2012 Treyarch game called Black Ops 2 was the first Call of Duty game to take place in a futuristic setting. I say futuristic, but it's set in 2025, which, funnily enough, is now only two years away. It featured a campaign, multiplayer, and of course the return of the super popular Zombies game mode. For a few of the previous titles, I was somewhat disappointed with the trophy list, both for omitting multiplayer entirely and for lacking genuine difficulty. Black Ops 2 fixed everything on this front. There was now finally a proper multiplayer section in the list, and it easily has the most difficult Call of Duty Platinum of the PS3 generation, being earned by about 1 out of every 100 trophy hunters who play this game. Now, multiplayer trophies aren't always loved by everyone, but in a multiplayer focused game, I think their addition is completely warranted. Two of the five trophies can be earned by simply winning a few games, and the two other ones are earned by making it to first prestige, which will take most players about 10 to 15 hours. Nothing too bad. The fifth trophy, however, is one of the most infamous trophies in all of Call of Duty, for one specific reason. The Big Leagues trophy has you win five games after being placed in the division in league play. This is where the one major downside to multiplayer trophies rears its ugly head, because the division system in league play shut down in 2015, making this the only unobtainable trophy in all of Call of Duty. I was playing this game on release, so I was lucky enough to get it before it was too late. Many people weren't so lucky though, since they now can't earn one of the most sought after platinum trophies because of this shutdown. It has gotten to the point that most of the discussion about this game on the forums is about whether this trophy should be whitelisted. The infamy of this game's trophy list stretches not just to the multiplayer though, but just as much to the campaign and to zombies. The story of the single player is easily my least favorite Call of Duty narrative up to this point. It features Woods, Mason and Hudson again, who are battling a populist movement under the command of a new villain called Raul Menendez. The main reason I dislike the campaign so much is that it has a non-linear story, meaning that certain decisions branch the story out in different directions. In any one of the eight endings, Mason can be alive or dead, Menendez can end up alive or dead, and Menendez's ultimate plan of launching a massive cyber attack can be a success or be stopped. I personally always prefer a single focus storyline rather than multiple storylines, because the singular focus storyline will have naturally received more care and attention. Quality over quantity. Also, it's now not clear which of the story branches is canon. As a result, the Black Ops storyline has to end here, because if a new game built upon these events, it has to pick a single reality and thereby deem all the other branching storylines irrelevant. The Black Ops 2 single player wasn't completely without merit to me though. One of the reasons that this is considered to be the hardest Call of Duty trophy list on the PS3 is a gold trophy called Giant Accomplishments, which involves completing the newly implemented single player challenges. Each of the 16 missions has 10 challenges for you to complete, making for 160 challenges in total. A lot of these challenges are really easy and generic, like getting a certain amount of melee kills, getting kills on horseback and finding every piece of intel. Some are actually quite fun and challenging though, like playing through a mission without dying and completing a section within a certain time frame. Two of the challenges are particularly infamous. The first is during the mission Perg Victory and requires you to dolphin dive onto an enemy grenade and survive. Surviving the explosion actually isn't a problem with flat jacket equipped, but funnily enough, in stark contrast to World at War, the enemies seem to outright refuse to throw grenades at you, so you can be waiting endlessly for an opportunity. The challenge itself is also quite finicky, so even if you do dolphin dive onto a grenade, there's a decent chance it won't count. The other challenge is universally seen as the hardest in the game. For this, you have to guide a spider drone through the vents in under 60 seconds. This time limit is actually extremely tight, so this challenge took numerous attempts for me. Annoyingly, you also have to sit through the entire intro sequence on every attempt, making this challenge even more stressful. In addition to the 11 story focus missions, the campaign also has 5 so-called strike force missions. In these, you take control of an entire squad in order to complete a set of objectives. I felt extremely indifferent about these missions though, as the objectives were all pretty easy, and since there was no focus on story here, I thought these missions were pointless. They all have 10 challenges as well, but a quick glance at the trophy guides should give you an idea of how boring these are. Besides giant accomplishments, the single player trophies don't pose too much of a threat. You need to play through most of the different storylines, which you can just google a guide for, and a veteran playthrough is required, which was the easiest veteran campaign up until that point.
This doesn't mean Black Ops 2 doesn't have more difficulty to offer though, far from it. As part of the Treyarch lineage of COD, Zombies once again made a return. This iteration was by far the most ambitious up until that point. It featured one giant map called Green Run, which was divided into five smaller maps, and in the new mode called Transit, you could travel by bus between all the smaller maps. In a sense, you were sort of road tripping through multiple zombie maps. Almost everybody thought this was extremely innovative, and I personally was very excited when I first got to load it up. And god damn, if this wasn't the absolute worst zombies map I had ever played. Riding the bus through the map is fun for about 10 minutes, up until you miss the bus once and get stranded, while your team is off to the next stop. You can run to the next map, but you will get jumped by these insanely annoying denizens, not to mention the thick fog and limited visibility, making it easy to get lost and walk in circles. Even worse, if you go down while the rest of your team is somewhere else, you're done. There's absolutely no way they can get to you in time. Also, since in the Black Ops 1 DLC cycle the entire earth was blown up, there's lava everywhere, which is yet another annoyance you can die to. Of course, transit is only one mode, and you can also play some of the smaller maps individually, but since they are so small, there's very little to do, and you will get bored quickly. The bus depot map doesn't even have perks or pack-a-punch. So, in short, you have three small but boring maps, and one giant terrible map. Sadly for most people, the trophies for zombies are actually quite a bit more difficult to earn than in Black Ops 1. Some of the trophies I thought were kind of fun, like Don't Fire Until You See, for which you have to open all the doors without stepping in lava once. This is obviously pretty difficult on this map. Standard equipment may vary I also enjoyed, where you basically have to go around the map and craft all the buildables. It takes some time, but it's still doable. Now, the platinum blocker for most people is a trophy called Tower of Babel, which has the cryptic description of obey the voices. To earn this trophy, you need to complete the easter egg. Since I'm not covering DLCs in this video, we kind of skipped over this development, but in the Black Ops 1 DLC release cycle, Treyarch started implementing so-called easter eggs, where your team has to work together to complete a sort of quest. These quests involve extremely obtuse steps that often have you figure out symbols and execute some kind of code, among many other things. The challenging thing about this is that you have to do these quests with zombies still constantly chasing after you. So to get through these, a good team and a great amount of teamwork are required. Such an easter egg returned for transit, and since I lacked a dedicated group, it was a trophy I simply wasn't able to earn during the release of this game. It wasn't until 2015, when I added someone from PSM profiles, that I started to seriously grind for this trophy. There's actually two ways to complete the easter egg, Maxis' side and Richthofen's side. And since Maxis' side can be done with two players, and has simpler steps, this is by far the preferred side. First, you need to go to the power station and turn on the power. Maxis will then start to talk to you, and orders you to turn it off again, so you do just that. Then, one of the players has to get EMP grenades from the mystery box. If you're unlucky and can't get the grenades in time, the run is basically over, and you have to start from the beginning again. After getting the grenades, the hard part begins. You have to take the bus again to go to this pylon in between the maps and wait there until a special electric zombie called the Avogadro spawns. Again, this is RNG dependent, so it might take forever. Once he does spawn, you have to start the painstaking process of luring this guy all the way under the pylon, while he is free to do damage to you, and while you're still being swarmed by zombies. Once you do get him under there, you have to kill him by throwing an EMP grenade, thereby supplying the pylon with power. To finish the easter egg, both players must place a buildable turbine under any two lampposts around the map, powering them as well. Maxis will say some things and his quest will be over. While some of these steps are extremely annoying, compared to other easter eggs, this one actually isn't too bad, and once I played with a decent player, I got it done in a few tries. After completing zombies, I only needed to earn the remaining single player trophies, mainly giant accomplishments. It took about a month of grinding for that trophy on and off, until I finally completed the list. Black Ops 2 was not a game that I loved on release. The single player was a mess and zombies was straight up awful. It did bring one extremely positive change though, admittedly insignificant for many people, and that is that Treyarch finally figured out how to make a great trophy list. The only blemish remains the Big Leagues trophy, which, as a reminder, makes this platinum unobtainable today. For this reason, it can be seen as the most valuable platinum trophy in the entire franchise. Add on top of this that the list is very difficult to begin with, makes this still one of my proudest platinum trophies to this day.
The stretch from Call of Duty 4 until Black Ops 2 is widely considered to be the golden age of Call of Duty, both in terms of popularity and quality. In every way, the 2013 Infinity Ward release, Call of Duty Ghosts, was the end of that golden age. In the multiplayer, several massive maps had been added, even though it launched with 12 player game modes as a maximum, which led to this game losing the fast paced, arcade shooter type feel that made these games so addicting. Furthermore, as opposed to Black Ops 2, the entire game had been bathed in this grimy, subdued color palette, making it hard to spot enemies. Ghosts was a bland, slow paced experience as a whole. What of course also has to be noted is that the new generation of consoles, the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, released shortly after Ghosts came out, meaning that Ghosts was the first Call of Duty to release on next-gen consoles. This makes it all the more sad that this was the least popular Call of Duty multiplayer in years. Call of Duty isn't all about multiplayer though, so let's see if the single player had any redeeming qualities. Like Black Ops 2, Ghosts takes place in the future, in this case 2027. Unlike Black Ops 2 though, the setting isn't futuristic at all, but rather dystopian. The US is no longer a superpower and is at war with the Federation, which is a group of powerful South American countries. You mainly play as Logan Walker, who, along with his brother and father, is a member of the Ghosts, an American Special Forces unit. Now clearly, this unit is a callback to the character Ghost from Modern Warfare 2, but it's not a continuation of the Modern Warfare storyline at all, and this game is set in a completely different universe. In other words, this is blatant fan service. I personally can't stand it when developers rely on superficial feelings of nostalgia and familiarity, rather than come up with interesting new ideas. It's probably not as big of a deal for most people, but this has always been a pet peeve of mine. The main goal of the Ghosts is to stop a man called Rourke, who was once the leader of the Ghosts, but after having been left to die by them, now works for the Federation. The setup of the story is extremely similar to most other Call of Duty games, but at least there were some really cool set pieces throughout. I particularly thought that the building grappling mission was outstanding, and Infinity Ward clearly thought so too, since it was copy and pasted onto the newest game. I also thought the mission in Antarctica and the stealth mission through the jungle were quite enjoyable. About two thirds of the way through, Rourke captures your team and ends up killing your dad. After this, you and your brother put everything on the line to take down Rourke. In the final mission, you manage to track him down successfully. A skirmish breaks out and you end up landing a shot on him. You save your brother from drowning and then the credits roll. Moments later though, you return to the game again because Rourke somehow survived all of that, has enough energy to knock you out and then takes you as a prisoner, setting up the story for the sequel. Due to the unpopularity of this game, that sequel was never made though, so this is where the ghost story ends. I personally felt extremely indifferent about this game's story, so I can't say it bothered me very much that it ended on a cliffhanger. While the trophy list isn't as great as that of Black Ops 2, I was actually quite happy with the single player trophies in Ghosts. There is a difficulty specific miscellaneous trophy called Piece of Cake. You have to clear an extremely crowded room on veteran difficulty without taking a single hit. On Veteran, you will be barraged with enemy fire the instant you show yourself, so you have to rely on stuns and nades to get through this. Probably my favorite trophy was Jungle Ghosts, where you have to complete the entire jungle mission without breaking stealth. This particular mission isn't as on rails as most Call of Duty missions, so you're truly left to your own devices to get through the mission unseen. One trophy was an absolute pain to get though. At the end of the mission Loki, you take control of a missile station, and for a trophy called They Look Like Ants, you need to take out all the enemy ground targets without hitting allies. You only have a limited amount of missiles, and it's also difficult to avoid hitting any of your allies, making it easy to mess up. Even worse, there's no checkpoints up until this point, so every time you fail this, you need to start the mission over from the beginning. It probably took me about 10 tries before I finally got this. Other than that, everything in the single player was fairly doable. Veteran playthroughs were getting easier by the year at this point, so I got that done with no issues. Funnily enough, this game also has the easiest trophy in the franchise, which you acquire by getting a single kill. Survival mode made somewhat of a return for Ghost, but I disliked the map so much that I never really played it. There's only one trophy related to it, the Hashi Reach 120 in one game. No challenge at all. I played one game, got the trophy, and never touched this mode again. Sadly, Infinity Ward also declined to follow Treyarch's lead in adding multiplayer trophies, so that leaves us with only one mode to discuss, Extinction. Again, Infinity Ward attempted to create a successful zombies counterpart, this time introducing an objective-based special mission involving an alien outbreak. 
It's sort of like Left 4 Dead. On launch, there was one map called Point of Contact, where you basically have to travel through a ruined city to destroy alien hives, plant a bomb, and then make an escape to the Xville. Of course, as you progress, you get barraged by increasingly tough enemies. Extinction was not massively successful. Most people preferred the round-based zombies game modes instead of a mission with a set endpoint, and as a result, the mode was never brought back after Ghosts. But I think it is absolutely fantastic. In fact, at the time, I preferred it to Zombies. In Zombies, there wasn't a way to truly beat a map, since the goal was simply to survive for as long as possible. Every game ended with a death, and as such, I always played with a strong sense of purposelessness. Of course, there are easter eggs with endpoints in Zombies, but since these typically weren't the focus of a map, most players weren't concerned with completing them. In Extinction, beating the map is the main objective, and at launch, it was actually really difficult to complete. As with every other Spec Ops mode, Extinction is more fun when played with a team. Beating this map requires great communication and cooperation, and because there is a finish line, it makes successful playthroughs extremely satisfying. During launch year, I used to solo queue all the time, until I found a lobby of people with mics. The process of getting thrown into a game with strangers, working together to make it to the end, and then bonding with them over the shared achievement is something I remember very fondly. This is the reason I love this game mode so much. A good zombies game still ends with a failure state, while Extinction ends with a celebration. For trophy hunters, Extinction is by far the biggest roadblock on their way to the Platinum. Three trophies in particular will cause a lot of players trouble. No Man Left, Throttled Escape and Completionist. For No Man Left, you need to complete the map in a four-player team with everyone making it to the Xville. It goes without saying that for this, it's best to play with a coordinated group rather than with random players. But even still, this remains tricky. The escape sequence is insanely hectic, with the toughest aliens swarming you constantly, so if one player goes down, it's a gamble to revive them. Throttle Escape is next, which has you complete the map with a relic active. Relics are basically handicaps that serve to make the map more challenging. The five relics are increased damage taken, decreased damage dealt, a smaller wallet, no primary weapon, and no class selection. Of these, the smaller wallet is universally seen as the easiest relic, as you can just spend the money instantly, instead of saving it up, mitigating the relic's effect. This was a trophy I personally didn't fight too bad, and as a result, I ended up earning it in the same run as No Man Left. Only one roadblock trophy remains, Completionist, which is easily the most difficult trophy in the game. For this, you need to complete every extinction challenge in a game, and then successfully escape. On every individual hive, a random challenge is given once you plant the drill, which you need to complete before the end of the hive. Most of these are super easy, like killing a certain amount of aliens with assault rifles or spending a certain amount of money. Some are very challenging though, and can ruin a run in an instant. My personal Achilles heel was a challenge for finding and killing the leper. The leper is a special type of alien, nearly indistinguishable from the others, that roams around the edges of the map. There's a special ability that allows you to spot enemies from a great distance, but I never managed to get consistent at finding him, especially since you only have 30 seconds. The challenge for maintaining 50% accuracy can also be a pain if it comes in the final area, as you won't have time to carefully aim at every enemy. The biggest run killer for me though was the challenge for killing a certain amount of aliens mid-air. There's simply no way to be quick enough to spot a jumping alien and kill them before they land, so your best bet is to play normally and hope you get lucky. It wasn't until I had a game where this challenge wasn't assigned that I finally had my successful run. After earning Completionist, it was time for the trophy mop up. Ghost is not a Call of Duty that is remembered fondly. It is inferior to its predecessors in many ways, and as a result of the decreased popularity, the intended sequel was never made. Among other things, this meant that the single player story and the Ghost's universe wouldn't be continued, something that I'm sure nobody laments. Though the game is absolutely not without redeeming qualities. Extinction wasn't everyone's cup of tea, but it sure was mine. For the first time, I managed to get the trophy list done before the release of the new Call of Duty, with this Platinum taking me 6 months to get, relatively short for me. The very last trophy I needed to earn was the trophy for collecting all the intel in the campaign, after which I earned this rare Platinum. Also, my capture card stopped working at the time, so it's a phone recording for this one.
The first 10 Call of Duty games were all developed by either Infinity Ward or Treyarch. Sometime after Modern Warfare 3, a new developer was added to the mix, a studio called Sledgehammer Games. They would be the studio to develop the 11th entry in the franchise, and in 2014 they released Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. I should know beforehand that this game released for both the PS3 and PS4, but since I still play it on PS3, I'm covering it in this video. That's also why the game isn't graphically optimal in my footage. Sledgehammer took the futuristic setting, previously used in Black Ops 2, and went wild with it. The game is set in the far future and features exoskeleton suits and other advanced equipment. Players could now fly across the map in these exosuits, bringing an end to the traditional boots on the ground gameplay. As such, this game marked the start of the jetpack era. I'm not gonna lie, the first week I played this game I was completely hooked on the jetpack gameplay. Being able to fly and dash across the map made gameplay fast-paced and exciting, and for the first time in ages, Call of Duty felt truly fresh again. After the novelty had worn off though, it became very clear that the jetpack gameplay was more of a nuisance than anything. The fact that everyone was flying through the air made gameplay chaotic and unpredictable in a bad way, as now you always had to keep the entire skybox into account as well. On top of that, the multiplayer map sucked, and the game overall had a very odd aesthetic. Ghost was a step in the wrong direction for sure, but Advanced Warfare was what many people perceived to be the true start of Call of Duty's downfall. What most people forget about this game though, is that the single player is absolutely incredible. The year is 2054. You play as Private Jack Mitchell, who along with his best friend Will Irons is enlisted by the US to fight in a conflict between North and South Korea. Things go wrong for the both of you though, and Irons sacrifices himself to save Mitchell from a fatal explosion. Mitchell loses his left arm, but does survive. Irons does not. Following this first mission, there is a short, playable sequence for Will's funeral, and it is at this point that we've reached what is by far the most culturally significant moment in the entire Call of Duty franchise. When approaching his casket, there is a silly interactive prompt to pay respects to Will's death, which on PC reads, press F to pay respects. On release, this prompt was mocked relentlessly for being a hilariously distasteful interaction in what is supposed to be a heavy moment. Since then, Press F to Pay Respects has taken on a life of its own and is now a very prominent part of internet culture. For example, if something goes wrong during a live stream, the chat will fill up with Fs, a way for the viewers to facetiously pay their respects. All of this originated from this short scene in Advanced Warfare. At the funeral, you're approached by Jonathan Irons, Will's father and CEO of a private military corporation called Atlas. Irons offers you a chance to join Atlas, and after accepting, provides you with a highly advanced prosthetic arm. In this story, the world is terrorized by an anti-Western organization called the KVA, launching attacks across the world and forming a nearly unstoppable threat to the Western nations. At this point, Irons is in charge of the most powerful and most advanced military in the world, and as a result, his forces are regularly hired by countries to deal with the KVA threats. Throughout the beginning of the game, the objective is pretty clear take down the KVA leader called Hades. This is done rather quickly though, as you manage to kill him in only the sixth mission. Here, a somewhat predictable but still well executed story turn occurs, as the dying Hades reveals that Irons knew beforehand of all of his attacks and did nothing to stop them. By letting the KVA wreak havoc on the world, Irons made the western nations completely dependent on his military power. On top of that, later in the story we learn that Atlas has secretly developed a bioweapon called Manticore that can instantly kill designated people based on their DNA. Irons finds out that Mitchell is onto him, and as a result you have to defect to a rivaling military corporation. Irons, now wanting Atlas to be the sole global leader, declares war on the world in what has become one of my favorite scenes in the franchise. To be the first CEO of a private corporation to become a member of the United Nations Security Council. Unfortunately, my appearance today has been clouded by a flurry of speculation that my company is developing a weapon of mass destruction which would be capable of targeting specific ethnic groups. I want to address these allegations head on. Are we developing such a weapon? No, we are not. Because we've already developed it. The objective of the game now is to stop Irons at all costs, and at the end of the game you infiltrate Atlas's headquarters with one of your old squadmates. 
Once you track down Irons, one of my favorite boss fights in the series ensues. In an oh shit moment, you realize that Irons is still in full control of your exosuit, making the balance of the fight strongly tip in his favor. After breaking out, you catch up to Irons and try to throw him off the building. He hangs on to your prosthetic arm, and in a symbolic gesture of payback, you cut the arm off. All in all, I thought the concept of a private military corporation aiming to rule the world was both interesting and well executed, and at the time, this was probably in my top 3 favorite Call of Duty campaigns. I'm going to keep the trophy discussion for the campaign pretty short, because honestly, it's the easiest single player section we've had in years. The only slightly difficult trophy is called Wheelman, which you earn by completing the hoverbike section without hitting walls or taking damage. Not just is it tricky to pull off, but since this section takes place at the end of the mission, you have to replay the entire thing to get another shot at the trophy. Another trophy that was actually quite fun to get was Party Crasher. Here, you have to sneak around Irons' villa and kill 20 enemies with a grappling hook, resulting in a fun stealth challenge. Now, there is a single trophy that is a bit of a grind. For power changes everything, you need to fully upgrade your exosuit. To achieve this, you need every upgrade point, and to earn all of them, you need 1600 kills, 100 headshots, 320 grenade kills, and every piece of intel. After my campaign playthrough, I was still missing a ton of normal and grenade kills, so I needed to farm these. As such, this was the very last single player trophy I earned. Sadly, Sledgehammer also did not get the memo from Treyarch about multiplayer trophies, but they did include a cooperative game mode, luckily with its own set of trophies. In this Call of Duty, the cooperative game mode was called Exo Survival, which, as the name might suggest, is basically survival mode with exosuits. I did not like this game mode at all. All of the maps were designed around the fast-paced exosuit movement, so there were almost no decent camping spots. The result is that you're constantly on the move, like in a zombie game, but as opposed to zombies, you'll get shot by enemies constantly. The most difficult trophy in the game is tied to this mode, and requires you to flip a survival map twice, which basically means that you have to reach round 51. Anyone who's played survival knows that reaching round 51 is pretty challenging, so I definitely had issues with this. I found it best to play one of the first maps, and just use score streaks as much as possible. I tried to get it with other players first, but since you have much less health when playing with more people, I ended up grinding it solo. I was more experienced with these types of modes at this point though, so luckily it didn't take too long to have a successful attempt. After earning this, only one Exo Survival roadblock still remained. A trophy called Exo Survivor. This requires you to finish the bonus wave on Riot, the final map. To unlock this map, you need to complete 225 waves on prior maps. In other words, you will be playing a lot of survival. Once Riot is unlocked, you need to play 10 waves on the map, after which a secret zombie outbreak commences. After surviving for a few minutes, you need to make your way to the Axel Chopper to escape and complete the wave. This weird zombie inclusion left a lot of people both confused and annoyed. If Sledgehammer took the time to add zombies, why not include a zombie game mode as well? It turned out that this was a teaser for the DLC cycle, which featured Exo Zombies as a game mode, which is universally seen as one of the worst zombie modes in a Call of Duty. After earning this, I only needed the Power Changes Everything trophy I mentioned earlier, so all that was left for me to do was to farm the remaining kills. Advanced Warfare ranks highly among my least favorite CODs ever. I'll admit that the campaign was very good, but my dislike for the multiplayer and survival left a bad taste in my mouth overall. The Platinum has actually been earned by a very low percentage of people, but I think in this case that can mostly be attributed to the lack of interest in this game, not the difficulty. Funnily enough, this is also my fastest earned Call of Duty Platinum. Clearly, I just wanted to complete the list and be done with this game. Three weeks after the release date, I did just that. The Call of Duty games from the PS3 era are some of my favorite games of all time. They brought us such an exciting and fast-paced multiplayer, so many beloved characters, and even invented the zombie game modes that still has an active fanbase to this day. In this video, I've showcased one of the many ways I've enjoyed playing all these games over the years, going for the Platinum Trophy. Despite my fondness of these games, however, I can't deny that Ghosts and Advanced Warfare were some of the weakest entries in the series. 
As a result, it seemed very possible at the time that the quality of the Call of Duty games would devolve even further and that the franchise would mostly lose its popularity. In the next part, we're going to see if any of that's true when I discuss the PS4 generation of Call of Duty games and their trophy lists. Lastly, I want to thank you sincerely for watching this video all the way through to the end. I hope you enjoy it and most of all I'm super curious to hear your thoughts. Other than that, have an excellent day and I'll see you in the next part. Life alert. Where are you now? <laughs> Life alert. Help. Where are you now? I watched the bad movie I and I can't get up. I need to go to the mental hospital. I was doing alright, but I watched this movie. Now I'm not doing okay, bro. I got life alert and it saved my life. Hey, this fucking hour and a half of my life. Makes me wonder why I didn't go to work. Thank you, Wakanda Forever. <laughs> <laughs> you got linked into the chain, bro. That's what it is. Like, you gotta connect, so we all have to watch. Like, we all have to watch the dumbass movie so we can know what the fuck the other person's talking about when they're talking about these dumbass movies. I gotta do a fucking dab. I gotta do a fucking dab. Just do a dab, bro. God damn it. <laughs> MP. They've got a thousand. We don't even know if Makarov's intel's any good. Price? Price? The healthy human mind doesn't wake up in the morning thinking this is its last day on Earth. But I think that's a luxury, not a curse. To know you're close to the end is a kind of freedom. Good time to take inventory. Outgunned, outnumbered out of our minds on a suicide mission. But the sand and rocks here, stained with thousands of years of warfare, they will remember us for this. And why is he here? He lost. As I always say, forgive your enemies, but remember their names. Now, gentlemen, as I like to think, in the long history of the world, that there are only a few generations. Sounds like someone breaking in! It's just a storm, Dick. Sit down. Oh my god! It appears the Pentagon has been breached. Zombies. Gentlemen, at times like these, our capacity to retaliate must be and has to be massive to deter all forms of aggression. Oh, oh, oh. 